Hello and welcome to the Literary Lair. Welcome back to Classic Novel Month 4, The Quest for Reed. years old. Do you know what my legacy is right now? This channel. All of these videos, which aren't very well known, are all I have accomplished by the age of 20. You know what I wish I had done by the age of 20? Wrote a best-selling novel. And if you think that's an impossible feat for a 20-year-old, allow me to introduce you to Susan Eloise Hinton, better known by her initials, S.E., who, at the age of 19, published The Outsiders, a book she wrote while in high school. Not to mention that by the age of 19, she also wrote a book that was and still is challenged for its inclusion into school curriculums. That's not even going into the fact that the film adaptation was not only made by Francis Ford Coppola, the guy who made the Godfather trilogy and Apocalypse Now, but also featured several actors who would later become household names, such as C. Thomas Howell, Rob Lowe, Emilio Estevez, Matt Dillon, Tom Cruise, Patrick Swayze, Ralph Macchio, and Diane Lane and had appearances from Leif Garrett and Tom Waits. Yeah, that Tom Waits. And yet, I never hear anyone talk about the movie. Anyway, we're not talking about the movie, we're talking about the book. And I have to give Hinton credit. I've been trying since high school to write a novel, and I still haven't been able to do it. But I'm happy to see that it is possible for teenagers to write acclaimed novels that are still debated about almost 50 years later. In fact, I probably should wait until next year, since that's the 50th anniversary. But if I waited for Classic Novel Month 5, I'd miss the anniversary by a few months anyway. So let's talk about it here. Let's not waste any more time and get straight into The Outsiders. cinematic, which is probably because it's the movie poster. Although, to its credit, unlike a lot of the ones they do nowadays, the movie poster cover looks really good. You get a good look at all the characters up in the sky hanging with Mufasa, and on the ground is presumably Tulsa, Oklahoma. I really like the cover, especially the placement of the title. Plus, and this might just be me, but I really like the fonts used for the title and author. But the composition is done very well, and so I applaud it. Anyway, let's get to the book. Our story is narrated by Ponyboy Curtis, who is leaving the movie theater with two things on his mind, a ride home and Paul Newman. And I can't figure out why, but I suddenly have a strange craving for salad dressing. Anyway, he gives us some backstory about himself, including his brothers, Soda Pop and Derry, with Soda being the fun brother and Derry being the mean one, because he has to take care of the other two since their parents died in a car wreck. He also gives us some knowledge of the social situation of his town, with frequent wars between the greasers, the poorer kids who are rough and tumble, of which Ponyboy and his friends are a part of, and the socials, or socias for short, who are the rich kids who throw wild parties and get out of all trouble because of their parents' money. It's a good thing those type of people only exist in books, right? 
On his way home, Pony is jumped by some socials who threaten him with a knife, but Pony Boy fights back and calls for help, which gets his gang into action. They're on higher alert since Johnny, the second youngest member of the group, got really knocked around by a group of socials in a blue Mustang recently, and they don't want that happening again. The socials run off, and the group checks on Pony to make sure he's okay. The group includes his brothers, Johnny, 2-Bit Matthews, the oldest of the group, Dallas Winston, the toughest, who used to live in New York and get into gang fights, and Steve Randall, Soda Pop's friend, who's not too happy about Pony tagging along everywhere, as Soda Pop will invite him along when they don't have dates. However, the gang is loyal to each other and always help each other out. Dallas wants to see a movie and invites the whole gang, but everyone is busy save for Pony and Johnny. They meet up with Dallas and go to the movies, where Dallas engages in his favorite pastime, harassing the girl sitting next to them. Yeah, Dallas isn't quite the pinnacle of chivalry that Don Quixote was. Anyway, those girls get fed up with Dallas, and Johnny, who idolizes Dallas, jumps to their defense. So Dallas backs down, as Johnny never speaks up like that, so he knows that Johnny is serious. The girls, Sherry and Marcia, who are sos girls who dicks their boyfriends because they didn't want them to get drunk at the theater, take a liking to the two, especially Sherry Valance, who goes by Cherry on account of her red hair. Ponyboy knows her as she's a cheerleader at his school, but as they are on different sides of the social ladder, they've never spoken before. Ponyboy and Cherry hit it off, with them both opening up like they've never opened up before, but they know that once they're back in school, they can't ever speak to each other, and Cherry says that she can never love Ponyboy, but could love someone like Dallas. Two-Bit shows up to warn Dallas about an impending hit ad on him, and hangs out with them and the girls. After the movie, Two-Bit wants to drive the girls home, since the streets aren't safe, and on the way to get Two-Bit's car, a blue Mustang shows up, much like the one that the socials who attacked Johnny drove, and Cherry and Marsh's boyfriends, Randy and Bob, get out, ready to kill Pony, Johnny, and Two-Bit for horning in on their girls. The girls agree to go with them to avoid a fight, which Pony is thankful for. They head home, and Johnny is shaken up, so Pony stays with him in the lot they hang out in to calm him down, telling him about his desire to live in the country. This goes on for so long that they fall asleep, and when they wake up, Pony rushes home, where Derry is pissed because he was worried sick, and is so angry that he hits Pony Boy, causing Pony to run to Johnny and decide to run away together. They get moving and head to a park, but are soon confronted by Randy and Bob again. And when Bob starts to drown Ponyboy in a fountain, Johnny stabs and kills him, and the other socials run off. Johnny is freaked out, and they realize that Johnny has to get out of town, so they run to the only person that can help them, Dallas, who is currently at a party hosted by Buck Merrill. They go to Bucks and tell Dallas what happened, and Dallas helps them, giving Pony a dry shirt and jacket, and giving them money and a gun to get out of town with, along with instructions to an abandoned church that they could live in. They hop on a train and hang out with Stephen and Amethyst, before hopping off the train to make their way to the church. Johnny goes to buy supplies before the papers have his description in it, and picks up food, mainly bologna, peroxide, and a copy of Gone with the Wind so Pony can read it aloud to pass time. The peroxide is to dye their hair so they're unrecognizable, but Pony doesn't want to cut his hair since he spent a lot of time getting it to how it was, but he relents and helps Johnny cut his hair. Pony also wishes that he had Pepsi since he is a self-professed Pepsi addict. Which I find to be terrible. A coke addict I can live with, but Pepsi? That's worse than China Cat. Along with the book, they also discuss a Robert Frost poem that Johnny likes, Nothing Gold Can Stay, which accurately portrays Johnny's feelings about life. A week later, Dallas comes to visit, bearing a letter from Soda Pop, which fills them in on what's happened, and that Derry is very sorry for hitting him, and Soda laments that he wishes that they'd come back and turn themselves in, but he understands why they can't, because Johnny would likely get the chair. Dally takes them to Dairy Queen and feeds them semi-real food, and tells them that because of Bob's death, there is an all-out war between socias and greasers going on. So much so that Dally started carrying a gun, that's unloaded of course. But it's not all bad with the war because they have a spy on the other side, 
Sherry Valance, who came to the Greasers to offer her services after the war started. Pony is shocked to hear that, and after they finish eating, Johnny decides that they're going to head home and turn themselves in. They take a detour back to the church to gather their things, but the church is on fire, which they believe that they may have started through a drop cigarette. They run up and see a man with several children, having taken them on a picnic, and he remarks that it's not really a bad thing, since the church was abandoned after all. However, the woman he was with runs up to him and informs him that they've lost some of the children. Whether it's through guilt or just their good natures, the boys leap into action, with Johnny and Pony rushing into the church to save the trapped children, and Dallas helping them out the window. They save the kids and the church starts to collapse, and Pony makes it out and turns turns around to go back for Johnny, but Dallas slugs him on the back and he passes out. He wakes up in an ambulance with the man, named Jerry, who tells him that Johnny and Dally are in the other ambulance, and that Dally hit him to put out his jacket, which was on fire. They get to the hospital, and Pony is no worse for wear, and waits in the waiting room to hear about Dallas and Johnny's condition, and Derry and Soda Pop show up, and Pony reconciles with Derry, before they're swamped by reporters and police, all asking questions. They answer as much as they can, and then go to the doctor to get the word on Dallas and Johnny. Dallas is fine. His arm is burned pretty badly, but he'll recover full use of it. Johnny is a different story. Johnny was hit by a piece of debris in the back and suffered bad burns. So even if he lives, he'll never walk again. Pony is distressed by the doctor's use of if, and they go home. In the morning, Two-Bit and Steve show up to see how Pony is doing and show them the paper, which hails him and Johnny as juvenile delinquents turned heroes. But what bothers Pony more is that they make reference to the fact that the courts might find Derry unfit as a guardian and put Soda and Pony in foster care. Gary and Soda have to work, so Tubit agrees to watch Pony for the day, and they go out to roam the town. Oh, uh, we'll be right back after I perform a few scans. And we're back. Everything's working perfectly. They run into some socias, mainly Randy, Bob's friend, who confides in Pony that he's not looking forward to the impending Socia Greaser rumble, and that he believes that Bob acted like he did because his parents thought he could do nothing wrong, and when he did, believed it was their fault and not their son's, and so he acted out because he was waiting for someone to tell him no. Randy's emotion and confiding in him makes Pony's opinion of him rise. They go to see Johnny, and he's pretty bad, telling Pony that he doesn't want to die yet. Pony gets him a new copy of Gone with the Wind, and Johnny passes out, so Two-Bit and Pony move on to Dallas's room. Dallas asks for Two-Bit's switchblade, and Two-Bit gives it to him as they talk about the impending rumble. They run into Cherry, and Pony begs her to see Johnny, but she can't face the guy who killed Bob, and tells them that they only knew Bob's mean, drunken side, and that he had a nicer side. Pony goes home and gets ready for the rumble between a few greaser gangs and the socias, and Pony notices that aside from their gang, most of the other ones are full of real hoodlums and not the type of respectable greasers that he and his friends are. They get ready to fight and meet the leader of the socias, Paul Holden, who played football with Derry, and they stand at a stalemate for a while, until someone shouts to hold on, and Derry turns to see who it is, and Paul gets him in the jaw, and the rumble starts. The person who showed up? Well, that was Dallas Winston. Wow. In the hospital and still ready for a rumble? He's even cooler than Ace Rimmer riding a crocodile out of an exploding Nazi plane. The rumble goes on pretty well, and the greasers come out victorious as the socias flee, but not before one of them kicks Pony in the head. Wow. Survived a church fire, almost being drowned, and he gets kicked in the head and he's still standing? He can take a beating better than Worf. Do Klingons fear death as much as humans? I could snap your neck in a second, but it wouldn't be as much fun. After the fight, Dallas gets Pony to come with him to see Johnny, who wasn't doing too hot when Dallas left, after using Two-Bit's blade to convince the nurse to let him out early. They speed there, and when they make it, Dallas threatens the doctor with the blade, and the doctor lets them see Johnny, but because they're his friends and not because of the blade. They get in, and Johnny is... 
while he's dying. They tell him of their victory, and he talks about how pointless the fighting is. Johnny tells Ponyboy to stay gold, and then dies. Pony takes it hard, but Dallas takes it harder, rushing out of the room, leaving Pony without a ride home. Pony starts to walk home, and he's picked up by a guy who offers him a ride, after noticing that Pony's head is bleeding. Pony gets into his house, and the entire gang, save for Johnny and Dallas, are there, and Pony gives them the bad news. It hurts them, but their morning is interrupted by a phone call from Dallas, who tells them that he held up a grocery store, and the cops are after him. They rush to the lot and get there quick enough to see Dallas in a standoff with the cops, and he raises his gun, which you'll remember is unloaded at them, and, well, you can tell what happened next. Pony can't take Dallas and Johnny dying the same night and collapses, waking up a few days later to the relief of dairy and soda. Pony's stuck on bed rest for the time being, and he's visited by a few schoolmates, and even Randy, who mentions Johnny, and Pony goes into denial, refusing to believe that Johnny is dead, and believing that he was the one who killed Bob. In this denial, his opinion of Randy drops once again. There's naturally a hearing about Bob's death, although without Johnny around, there's only the formalities to go over. Everyone gives their testimony about Bob and the circumstances around the fight, but when they get to Pony Boy, they only ask about Gary and his home slash school life. Pony is acquitted of all charges and the case is closed. Pony goes back to school and starts doing badly and stops eating, since everything tastes like bologna to him. And his teacher tells tells him that he's going to fail English unless he can hand in a good paper written about anything he wants to write about, which Pony agrees to do. Pony hangs out with 2-Bit and Steve, and a few socials come up to confront him for killing Bob, and Pony busts a bottle, ready to use it against him, despite the fact he was refusing to do so earlier in the novel. He goes home and tries to write the story, but can't focus on it and starts drawing horses. Soda comes home, and Derry and Pony start fighting again, and Soda runs out of the house, leaving behind a letter from his ex-girlfriend, who he loved and allegedly had left because of her parents, but the letter is one he sent to her, returned and unopened. They chase after him, and Pony finally starts to understand both his brothers, and Pony finally opens up the copy of Gone with the Wind, which Johnny had left to him, and reads one last letter from Johnny, who is at peace with dying since he saved all those kids, needs of the many, and all that. He also tells Pony to stay gold once again, but explains himself by using the poem to highlight how new and cool life is as a kid, and tells Pony to stay that way about life. The novel ends with Pony finally beginning his paper, and starting it the same way the novel started, with Pony leaving a film with two things on his mind, Paul Newman and a ride home. And that was The Outsiders. It does not feel like a first-time novelist wrote it, like the way that Angel Armor did. It just feels like a novel. There are a few quirks here and there, like how it's a little confusing, since for most of the book, Dallas is called Dally. And I only called him Dallas here, so no one would confuse him with Derry. There are a lot of plot points that are brought up, to only use once or twice, like Ponyboy being on the track team, and that doesn't mean that the book is bad, mind you, it's really good. I'm just super nitpicky. It's also one of those books that just tug and tug at your heartstrings. People say that Stephen Moffat and George R.R. R. Martin are the kings of taking your favorite characters, but it's just so much worse when instead of shock deaths, the deaths have meaning, and even if it's only two characters out of a huge cast, it makes an impact. I love this book. It's everything a good novel should be. It has great characters, funny parts, sad parts, awesome parts, and even the antagonists of the book are well-written three-dimensional characters. I highly recommend this book to everyone, because it's just such a damn good book that everyone should read it, at least once. If not for the wealth of literary symbolism, then just for the fantastically written characters. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of the literary layer, you can hit the subscribe button, and if you have any comments or complaints about the video, you can put those in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video, show it to your friends and share it around the internet. And maybe consider supporting the show on Patreon. I'll see you next time.
Hello and welcome to the Literary Lair. Welcome back to Classic Novel Month 4, Revenge... No, it's not Revenge. 